Welcome everyone to the third discussion in our film screening and discussion series at Contagion. Contagion is Science Gallery Bengaluru's first fully online exhibition season, which runs until the 13th of June. Uh, yeah. This exhibition season explores the transmission of diseases, behaviors, and emotions. I'm Gayatri Manu, the program associate at Science Gallery Bengaluru. Disease, which is the film that we're going to be discussing today, is being screened along with four other films throughout the duration of the exhibition. For those of you who might have missed watching the film before joining the discussion, you can find a link to the film in the chat box. I'm pleased to introduce you to uh, Mariam Ghani and Rashmi Sane. Mariam Ghani is an artist, writer, and filmmaker. Her work looks at places, spaces, and moments where social, political, and cultural structures take on visible forms and spans multiple disciplines. Her films have been screened at Berlinale, Rotterdam, uh, Sheffield Dockfest, Ann Arbor, FIDBA, and Cinema Retrovato, among other festivals. Her work has also been exhibited and screened at Gagenheim, MoMA, Medbrewer, and Queen's Museum in New York, among others. Rashmi Sane is a Bangalore-based cultural theorist and associate professor in film and cultural studies at Christ University. She writes on film uh, and the visual arts and is co-founder with Lucia Imas King of Vision Mix, an international network of artists, filmmakers, and researchers. Her curatorial projects include Future Orbits and Video Vortex, both as collaterals of the 2017 Kochi Museris Binale, Set Reset on Cinema and Labor at the House of Enquiry in Goa, and Loss and Transients Gong Ha Museum, Taipei, in March to May 2021. Her recently edited volumes include Women at Work, The Cultural and Creative Industries, and The Moving Image, South Asian Trajectories. The short version of disease looks at the metaphors we use to describe illness and how some diseases become metaphors to describe other phenomena. Before I pass the mic on to Mariam and Rashmi, I would encourage you to type your questions in the Q&A box. We will reserve the last 15 minutes of the discussion to take your questions. Over to you, Rashmi and Mariam. Okay, thank you, Gayatri, for the introduction and uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I think we've got used to doing this online uh, gig over the last year and a half, but it still doesn't stop being strange talking into a vacuum. Uh, so, Mariam, uh, it, it's lovely to be sharing the stage, so to speak, with you uh, across continents, which I think is possible only because of this online mode that we've been doing. Uh, and I must, to begin the, uh, our conversation, say that I really enjoyed your short film. Uh, I suppose that the, all of our audience may not have watched it. I hope they have. If you haven't, please go and watch it. It's an eight-minute film. Uh, but Mariam is at the moment working on a longer feature-length film, uh, developing the material that she's used in the short version of the film. So, Mariam, maybe if you could start by talking about how uh, you conceptualized the project which you worked on in 2018, not knowing uh, that we're going to be thrown into this, you know, madness of uh, the coronavirus. And a lot of your film talks about the Ebola and, uh, uh, you know, sometimes also in very funny ways uh, using the media footage. Uh, but if you could maybe talk about the conceptualization of the project and how your approach to the project may have changed in the last year and a half, given that we've actually been through uh, a very surreal experience of living through this, uh, you know, in a very intense way in every part of the world ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the project originated during um, a multi-city project initiated by the Wellcome Trust in 2018 that was called Contagious Cities. And that was um, put together by Welcome to commemorate the centenary of the 1918 flu pandemic, uh, and also to raise awareness about pandemic preparedness, um, because they thought we weren't prepared enough for pandemics, which turned out to be sadly very true. Uh, so they basically had an artist in residence in every one of the cities of the project. And I was the artist in residence commission for New York. 
and they put together a really interesting coalition of partners, all of whom had great archives. And they gave me a very wide brief for the project commission, which was basically just make something about contagion and cities and migration and virality. And I was like, okay, <laughs> that's very, that's very broad. I could do a lot of things within that, but I'd never really made any work about disease. Uh, before that, so I decided to start with something that I did know, which is language. I made quite a lot of work about language and migration before, and I went back to an essay that I'd always been very fond of, which is Susan Sontag's Illness as Metaphor, which if, uh, if you haven't read it before, people in the audience is a great essay to seek out. Um, it's, uh, it's a very angry essay also is something I realized when rereading it as, as a, you know, a woman in my forties, it's like, oh, she wrote this while she was undergoing treatment for cancer and she was furious, like absolutely furious while she was writing this, which was an interesting insight that I had not had when reading it in my teens in college, right? Um, so I decided to kind of take illness as a metaphor as the starting point for the project, but um, expand it and kind of update it to look at metaphor and visual culture rather than just in um, literature, which is really what Sontag is looking at. Um, and also to, to kind of look at diseases other than cancer and tuberculosis, which is the scope of that essay. Um, and that was really the starting point. But what happened was while I was doing this research for the film, I got very interested in this one specific metaphor, which was the metaphor of the war on disease. And I became very curious about why it was so prevalent and why it seemed to be doing so much in the world. And so I wanted to kind of retrace its historical origins, see how many languages it operated across and try to understand you know, what its effects were in the present. And it started making me actually quite anxious <laughs> because one of the things it seemed to be doing or, or that it seemed to have done over the course of, you know, the previous decades was really um, have shifted responsibility. It was one of the things that was sort of, mm -hmm you know, behind this shift in responsibility for pandemic preparedness from public health agencies to national security agencies. Uh, and I, I personally found that like a very worrying shift, this, this move into a, a bioterrorism national security paradigm for pandemic preparedness. Um, and and that, was, that was sort of the point I was at actually when, when the pandemic started was this point of actually worrying a lot about what might happen when, it, when the next pandemic came, which all the epidemiologists I had been reading and talking to were anticipating would come at, at any moment. Everyone thought we were due for, due for a pandemic. Um, not only because of all the emerging infectious diseases, but also because of all the ways in which we were not prepared you know, on a governmental level to deal with emerging infectious diseases. Okay, so before we can move into your mm -hmm. work on the feature uh, film, as well as uh, the specific metaphor of the war and uh, even terrorism. Yeah. Uh, and um, yeah, maybe we just uh, spend a little time with Sontag, uh, whose work mm -hmm. uh, it, it indeed is very, very interesting uh, for the essay illnesses metaphor yeah. which you use, but uh, I was also thinking Sontag herself has made four films, right? I mean, a mm -hmm. lot of people refer to her as a literary critic and a writer, uh, and not much is actually spoken about her own film work, mm -hmm. uh, which I found quite interesting, uh, particularly because her, I think her very well-known work against interpretation, mm -hmm. uh, in which she takes this, again, a very angry stand about the interpretation of art, or mm -hmm. limited, right? Uh, and that it is what it is, a way much yeah. to see. And I found find it very interesting uh, in the way that metaphor actually is a uh, is a you know a facility, a capacity of language. It's a capacity of the expressive arts uh, in some sense, and it's also as cognitive 
theorists would uh, suggest it's a way in which human society uh, learns to make sense of realities that they can't quite comprehend by attaching mm -hmm. another conceptual framework to it, right? Yep. Uh, and uh, and uh, as much as it can be problematic in the way that something like a, 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 you know, epidemic or a, a disease or illness gets attached to mm -hmm. a conceptual world of war or attack or battle, uh, it also holds possibilities in terms of actually snatching away uh, that very object from the discursive terrain that it has been kind of attached to. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think I'm very interested in that space, that possibility of reclaiming that metaphor might allow us. And uh, so I return to the question about your feature now. Uh, so, so, so in a sense, film also is, you know, works with metaphors in some sense. Uh, and maybe if you can talk about Sontag's wider body of work in this, I mean, not necessarily her wider body, but her wider body in, uh, in, you know, in terms of its relevance to your work. Um, mm -hmm. and, and this kind of tussle between the sciences in terms of you get what you see, you know, mm -hmm. and it is what you see that's there in some sense, which I found uh, coming into your short film in a very interesting way in, in terms of where, where, where the medical discourse uh, and the scientific discourse has moved over the mm. last two uh, centuries, the, uh, you know, kind of uh, linguistic or our, uh, imaginative uh, discourse seems to be still located in an older paradigm. Mm. Is one of the implicit arguments yeah. uh, that I got from your film. And I'm, I'm going to stop here, but I just want to say <laughs> that Maria Muses starts off using a very interesting sentence, which is that, uh, you know, an argument is seen as a as as a war, uh, mm -hmm. but let's imagine an argument as a dance. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we should try and do that here. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. it's not an argument that you and I. Have, <laughs> but in the yeah, yeah. If we can kind of tango a bit, so I'm handing handing it over to you now. Yes, that's a that's a proposition from this you know very classic work of cognitive linguistics, um, Lake Off and Johnson's metaphors we live by. And one of the things that that I sort of suggest in my film is that the war on disease is a metaphor we both live and die by. Right? Um, I think you 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 put a lot of very interesting things on the table there. So let me see what I can what I can pick up from it. Um, one of the things is that I think indeed um, one of the sort of ideas that I explore in the film is this notion that that scientific discourse and cultural discourse have kind of moved apart from each other in terms of how they depict human microbial relations. Um, and uh, scientific discourse at the moment is in a space where there, there's a very complex model of human microbial relations, which is a very interdependent model. Um, and it interdependent both on, on a kind of individual scale where we're, we're, we're living with our microbes in a very, very complicated way where they do a lot of things for us and we do a lot of things for them. Um, but also on a, on a very macro scale where all these new studies of like the ocean microbiome and the ocean biosphere and so on are now suggesting that um, viruses and bacteria that um, live in the ocean are providing a really significant portion of the oxygen on the earth. Um, so we're actually interdependent with these microbes in a lot of ways that are only just becoming apparent to science in the past decade. Um, however, where cultural and especially pop cultural discourse around microbes is at the moment is still kind of about a hundred it's reflecting the science of about a hundred years ago, which is the, the emergence of germ theory, um, which is this moment when Koch and Pasteur first discovered the existence of bacteria. And, you know, there was this, this kind of coincidence in a way of that, that moment um, happening when there was also a, a consolidation of nationalism. And so you have a, a kind of, uh, a very quick taking up of the image of the bacterium um, and the conversion of that image into a metaphor 
of the the body as a nation state being breached by enemy bacteria and that that becomes a really really persistent image um, that of course changes in various ways but it, it really really persists over time in the cold war it becomes more like um, aliens <laughs> uh, and uh, we see a lot more a lot more kind of sci-fi you know versions of this story um, and you could also trace it back earlier to this kind of colonial moment um, uh, there's a really interesting recent book by Anjali Fatima Raza Kolb called Epidemic Empire, um, which you know makes an argument around the, the moment of um, the 1819 mutiny um, and the uh, application of the, epide the epidemic metaphor to rebellions uh, in the colonial context um, as the kind of origin point for this sort of um, mutually reinforcing epidemic terrorism metaphor that we still have today. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's a lot that we can talk about there. Um, there was one other thing you put out that I thought, oh yes, this, this like the vision of science. Um, and I think the idea of like the vision of science being neutral is something I would want to push back against. And there, I think we're really with Donna Haraway rather than Susan Sontag, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think, I mean, if you look at like the way that, that um, diseases are imaged, right? And you see those like really extraordinary um, scanning electron microscopic images of, of diseases that circulate or the 3D images of diseases that circulate. Those are, are actually quite constructed images in a lot of ways because all of the color is false color, right? Um, so there are choices being made in the, in the construction and then dissemination of those images. Um, and in the 3D modeling and all these kind of really interesting 3D animations that come out of places like the NIH, NIAID, um, and parallel institutions in other parts of the world, like there's there's really interesting choices being made in those sorts of, you know, uh, in the building of those 3D models, the color that's applied to them, um, the sort of like ways that they move through these animations. There's a really also persistent metaphor there that Haraway identified in the 80s that's about inner space looking like outer space, mm. you know, that has to do with this idea of science being able to see everything yeah. everywhere and having this viewpoint that is like the god's eye view that is totally you know omniscient like the the equivalent of an omniscient narrator basically you know we can't locate who it is so it must be a neutral view because it's everywhere all the time yeah so that's very interesting and you know this is something that i've been thinking about in in, in, in the context of uh, actually the development of the photographic uh, camera and the cinematic uh, camera and uh, in the kind of you know lineage of galileo and the telescope and the microscope the <clears throat> sorry the human kind of desire to want to see very far and very close yeah uh, and and uh, you know that this kind of the, the desire actually precedes the our invention of uh, cinema per se and i think mm -hmm. and, and i was just uh, referring to uh, professor david arnold's talk uh, which was held as part of uh, this series a few days weeks ago uh, mm -hmm. which was very interesting when I mean, he was talking about the way in which uh, you know some of these images of diseases were actually visualized and uh, wasn't quite very neutral as we know. Um, so uh, so it, it kind of seems to me that, you know, I, I mean, you can't really separate the imagery of cinema uh, from the imagery of science in the, in the sense that mm -hmm. we know that a narrative cinema was an accident and, you know, mm -hmm. cinema could have taken any other form. Uh, and it was really the technology that was used to kind of to tell stories. Um, and so I would actually suggest that if you look at the cinematic camera amongst the many, many cameras that allow us to see very closely and or the lens are very closely, very far. And uh, uh, But there is something very interesting 
that cinema does, which I think other kinds of lenses or uh, scientific uh, technologies, machines don't, which is that it allows us to in fact construct this kind of you know, narrative in time and space. Uh, mm -hmm. So if we come back to your now construction of the longer feature uh, film and how do you then narrativize something like a film around dis-ease, uh, mm -hmm. the discomfort of the body in some sense. Yeah. So if you could you know, talk about mm -hmm. how from, the, from your aesthetic uh, choices in the short film, uh, you're, you said you're using interviews and other kinds of material now, mm -hmm. and uh, along with the archival material. So mm -hmm. how, does, how does that narrative kind of technique uh, tango with the microscopic and mm -hmm. the other kind of scientific uh, lenses that we use? Mm an interesting question yeah um well one of the things that we're doing in the feature is actually using the form of an outbreak narrative which is in fact a narrative form to interrogate outbreak narratives right and to, to sort of it's a little bit cheeky right but we're forming the whole film as an outbreak narrative but that's tracing basically the the emergence and spread of the idea of the war on disease, of, of this metaphor. Mm -hmm. um, so tracing it as if it itself is an outbreak. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's an, <laughs> we'll see if it works. That's the, that's the idea right now, is, is that that will be the kind of overarching structure of the film. It also is, is set out in chapters and each chapter is um, centered around a specific historical episode um, in our kind of human history with diseases. And it also contains a series of proposals for the future uh, that are sort of linked to these historical episodes. And I think this is the major difference from the short, which was only concerned with, with the historical. Um, is that the feature the feature is also concerned with the future uh, and really this question of what do we do next and how do we how can we how should we you know reset the world post pandemic um, in a more just and equitable and sustainable mode because you know having you know still as as you are as we all are you know having spent this this year and a half living through this, this extreme period, which exposed so many really fundamentally broken things in this world. Of course, that's the question that I'm thinking about the most now is, you know, how, how, can, how can we do better? Because we must, we must do better, right? You know, yeah. yeah so, okay, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I'm, right now in India for audiences who join from here and also, elsewhere in the world but we are currently uh, I think in a really really terrible situation and uh, yeah. it's been widely reported internationally uh, you know responsibility has been put on the current government for being completely clueless and mm -hmm. having done absolutely nothing about a situation that they pretty much knew was going to happen mm -hmm. uh, and you know I mean I don't think this is the forum to talk at length about our, our very, very efficient government. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, I think it's important, as you say, to uh, look into systemic failures. And I, 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 I suppose I wouldn't be uh, wrong to say that there is large spread anger uh, against the system. Um, as I was telling you before we went live, mm -hmm. every day one hears of somebody or the other passing away who one has yeah. A lot of my students have lost a parent in the last month and it has just been a relentless nightmare just waking up every day has been uh, you know you don't know what news you're going to wake up to, right so uh, i think it's not just ab about uh, I, I, there's also a lot of mental health issue questions yeah. involved here um, so i want to return to the proposition that you're trying to make for the future yeah. uh, and also in terms of how certain ideologies like let's say eco-criticism or uh, looking at the human body you know, within a wider ecological 
context mm-hmm. uh, which were not framework which aren't entirely new frameworks i mean there are communities mm-hmm. who've known these and uh, oh yes then uh, you know they've had their own indigenous knowledge systems which mm-hmm. uh, have been constructed as alternative let's say within the scientific discourse yeah. um and also what you mentioned earlier that the human body itself is not a whole in this uh, you know a complete independent entity in the sense that we have so many microbes and bacteria mm-hmm. that actually help us to exist and survive mm-hmm. um so uh one of the the kind of you know I, things that have been widely discussed now and spoken about is a the failure of the demo the, the demo of democracy as we know it mm-hmm. uh, you know whether democracy is indeed a uh, fair enough just enough mm-hmm. system for our future uh, and i was listening to another the uh, the david graeber memorial talk by alpasha a few weeks ago where you know she was talking about uh, sortition uh as mm-hmm. a possible method for uh, you know electing your leader mm-hmm. so i think it it involves a very fundamental shift in the way we think about who is capable of leading uh what is a system meant to do who are the uh, entities that you know uh, make up a system what are their re- responsibilities and relationships mm-hmm. to each other and so on um so 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 in the film that you are making uh, and the things that you're thinking through uh could you perhaps briefly share uh, some of these propositions that you are actually thinking about how do how does the uh, invisible or visible only under a microscopic uh, lens world of other viruses and bacteria help us in some way to think about human societies or the human world you think that uh, you are you are trying to draw from the animal world or uh, because a lot of people have been doing that uh, you know mm-hmm. that, i mean kind of you, the human being as a part of a wider ecosystem mm-hmm. and not not necessarily superior to anybody mm-hmm. else out there um so so if if uh, we speculate that democracy is actually failing us in the way that it is practiced today in many parts of the world and if we were to think of a hypocrisy of some sort mm-hmm. uh where more than human beings might have rights and duties and obligations mm-hmm. uh this may not be linked directly to your film but maybe you could speak about your the propositions you are trying to make mm-hmm. yeah i mean i think we're we're at a stage where i don't know yet which which propositions the film will contain in its final form because a lot of these will come out of the interviews that we haven't done yet um but um I think one of the things we're looking at certainly is the more than human future of medicine for sure uh, because I think that is where public health is going uh, is into this ecosystem model of public health which is you know the the one health model um which is really looking at um how uh wildlife livestock and human health are all intimately connected uh and if you don't look at them together you are not going to be able to understand what is happening to human health um and of course as you said this is you know this this idea of the ecosystem view of human health is actually a very old idea you know it's an idea that in fact has been circulating in indigenous communities for millennia you know so that's also something that we want to look at is you know how are indigenous communities thinking through and living through this pandemic um uh another thing that we're looking at is you know we're not we're not just looking to the microscopic or to the to the scientific kind of experience or or knowledge um because there is of course also social medicine um as a way of practicing epidemiology which is a very different kind of tradition of epidemiology right and so what is coming out of that kind of side of the field um and what are the propositions coming out of that side of the field and then of course there's a whole tradition of dewey uh radical activism in public health um that's 
very community driven and grassroots. So there are propositions to come out of there as well. And then there's some really interesting work coming out of the community of um, uh, chronic, chronic illness. So people who have chronic illness who are really thinking about um, illness as a revolutionary state um, and how can we reconceptualize it that way and care as something that should be understood as permanent rather than temporary. Um, and, you know, this idea that sickness and wellness can't really be understood as states with hard borders between them <laughs> anymore, especially in this moment when, you know, we really have to kind of shift our paradigm to thinking no longer just about taking care of each other, but also of taking care of the entire planet. So, you know, can we really talk about care as something that we only need sometimes, right? And, and that that feels that doesn't really feel as possible as it used to to say I only need care, you know, like one tenth of the year. Right? Um, that 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 doesn't that doesn't really feel as true, you know, as it might have. Um, so I I mean I think this is uh, very in, you know inseparably linked to the question of rights and uh, policy and so on. Mm -hmm. Uh, not only public health policy, but I think policy across sectors, uh, you know, mm -hmm. policies within the work space, for example, or mm -hmm. uh, insurance policy. Yeah, of course. The big elephant in the room that nobody really talks about. But um, I think one of the areas where really the envelope has been pushed is in relationship to our understanding of disabilities as a differently abled uh, mm -hmm. body, right? And I uh, and I think uh, there's quite a lot of uh, activism as well as uh, uh, policy change that has ha been happening uh, mm -hmm. and progressively there, um, which really kind of allows us and encourages us to look at bodies as not being a homogenous, healthy, perfect, you know, must look like this and weigh mm -hmm. this much and not any more or any less. Uh, Kind of thing, and I think the real struggle there is to uh, is to uh, talk in terms of diversities, you know, the diversity mm -hmm. of bodies, uh, the diversity of states of bodies, as opposed to the norm of being. You know, these measurements mean that you're. Of course, they're very valuable measurements. I mean, if my blood pressure were to go really high or really low, I want to know <laughs> what the deviation is, right? But but in some sense, whether there is a way to understand. Uh, that these figures may mean, uh, you know, uh, may, may have a meaning within a limited framework and uh, mm -hmm. that we need more kinds of systems uh, of knowledge to actually understand this in a more holistic way. And uh, so, so I think, you know, that if one were to learn something, one would have to learn from uh, activists of uh, you know, uh, promoting different label bodies and the understanding of mm -hmm. disability uh, per se. Uh, but I also find it very interesting that in the older tradition of the metaphor of the body, uh, illness and disease is understood as uh, an imbalance, mm -hmm. right? Which uh, in the kind of industrial age and with the development of uh, medical technology, let's say, uh, mm -hmm. including the microscope and so on, um, the body becomes parceled into smaller units. And this is interesting because on the one hand, as Sontag herself also says that, you know, it's, uh, and, and I, I think you, your film mentions it as well, that every cell, uh, you know, emerges from another cell in, in, in the context of cancer. So a cell mm -hmm. that is now one, now cancerous was once a healthy yeah. cell. So uh, it isn't as if it's a kind of, it's a mutation of some sort and mm -hmm. different diseases and illnesses have different relations between the body and the cause uh, of the illness. Um, so, 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 so I'm wondering whether our kind of, uh, in the last 200, 250 years, uh, as medical science, uh, as, you know, as it has developed, um, 
the ability to actually single out small units of the body to un, yeah. you know, treat them in in that micro kind of way uh, also accompanied in uh, chemistry by the development of nanotechnology mm-hmm. uh, right which allows all laser treatment yeah. non invasive treatment which is wonderful because you know who wants to be cut up and uh, mm-hmm. stitched up again and so on and so forth um but i wonder how one reconciles this this you know uh, the targeting of mm-hmm. that specific problem within the body uh, as a modern scientific approach versus mm-hmm. the older and perhaps what we are suggesting may be the way to go forward which is that mm-hmm. there is something called a balance mm-hmm. whether it is within the body or whether it is the human being in relationship to the environment or ecology uh you know and so 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 uh and uh, and neither you or i are scientists or doctors or uh, medical mm-hmm. experts yeah. but there may be some in the audience and maybe they have something <laughs> to say in terms of how modern mm-hmm. medicine is thinking about uh some of these issues uh, but i just wanted to put this out there as well that you know there there seem to be kind of two approaches mm-hmm. and both have their own merit and it almost seems as if uh you know you 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 need to put your faith in one over the other in some sense mm-hmm. right uh, or how does one get the two to work together mhm you have any thoughts on this sure yeah i think um what's interesting is that of course as medicine has become able to address itself to smaller and smaller parts of the body um we've also of course seen capitalism become able to hive off smaller and smaller pieces of you know individuals for capital um i don't think that's actually an accidental parallel um what we're also seeing happen in science as i think the understanding of the role of autoimmunity in diseases like cancer um becomes more clear is also a clearer understanding of the role of environmental factors in those diseases and so i think you know there will come a time when those two things reconcile i don't think we're there yet but you know there is a wealth of there is a wealth of evidence on one level for things like cancer clusters for you know all these other contributing factors to um from the environment to creating and creating susceptibility for to creating vulnerabilities to these kinds of diseases but what intervenes between you know the ultimate kind of scientific recognition of and medical treatment of these diseases in a more holistic way that would you know fully recognize and mediate remediate actually the the larger structural causes <laughs> of these diseases actually is capitalism <laughs> so you know yeah, yeah. So i think i mean you know uh, now is a good time to talk about systems and failing systems Uh, and uh, you know uh, the great expertise that i think governments pretty much all over the world have developed in washing their hands of responsibility and saying you look after yourself so uh, prime yeah. minister here has very very uh, you know kind of loudly said that we use a hindi word called atmanirbhar that is self reliant uh, yeah. basically saying that look we are not looking out for you so you better look out for yourself right? yeah. so uh, so so and i think here is uh, the thing that you know uh, we need to talk more and more about in in terms of uh, let's say for example uh, in india we witnessed the horrific uh, aftermath of the uh, union carbide uh, mobile gas tragedy right and yeah. the uh, impact that has left on generations of people so uh, nobody has really taken responsibility for that um i think there are hundreds of other such examples of nuclear reactors being set up in different places and um you know it it really doesn't matter what effect that is going to have on the people who are living in those neighborhoods and there are people living in those neighborhoods um so um 
so the question then really is that if and 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 you know we have to devise ways of moving forward here uh, and clearly it seems as if there is no way to return to a system where the government would actually take responsibility for the well-being of their people that doesn't seem to be uh, of concern uh, and you know this is where my kind of interest or uh, slight skepticism about uh, you know how we are developing our democracy you know is it in the interest of capitalism mm -hmm. is it in the interest of industry or is it actually in the interest of the people who live there uh, yeah. right so um so yeah so so the question i suppose i mean if there is a question in this because it's really quite kind of a, a slightly angry and annoyed uh, outpour against uh, failing systems and i say this and as a, this will uh, possibly be kind of my uh, you know one of my last comments uh, and then i think we have some time to open it out to the audience but uh, i say this because i uh, have uh, been hearing every day from friends who have lost siblings parents yeah. uh, you know people who were too young to go uh, and in india it is it has been just horrible because people have not been able to get oxygen when they've needed it they've not been able to get hospital beds uh, they have just not been able to get any treatment uh, and many of us have not been able to get vaccines so clearly there is you know a huge failure of the system here um, and it will take a lot of international solidarity uh, a, you know pressure from all kinds of uh, sites to actually address any of this because otherwise it just gets lost within uh, you know the media doesn't report anything very clearly um so i think i'm going to kind of uh, uh, you know stop here and uh, let you have the last word in 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 uh, you know since the discussion is uh, around your film and the many issues that it has generated that are leading us to have this conversation but it would be very interesting indeed uh, to use a platform like this to perhaps speculate about possible um, solidarities i mean not just you know uh, solidarities in terms of signing petitions or saying i'm with you or in solidarity but actually what does it take to uh, bring into effect networks of uh, in enforcing or impacting some transformation uh, mm -hmm. of course if the scientific community speaks up that is always heard more loudly than uh, things are heard when people who are filmmakers or writers uh, say these things and i think that is a very very important community um, that we need to be speaking out about the 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 sheer failure of the system in some sense um, but also in terms of international solidarity so i will uh, stop here and uh, maybe if you want to add something or how you see your film okay. making a difference here or you know your mm -hmm. own uh, teaching and activism uh, mm -hmm. how do you actually see this because it's not while it is definitely a question about specific nations countries and governance or the lack of it there i think it's a much larger question as well uh, in mm -hmm. terms of the future of the earth uh, mm -hmm. our futures as a society right so mm -hmm. So yeah, that I think would be my final thing to say. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, one of the things that the war on disease metaphor does is because it, you know, suggests that germs are coming for us, like some inexhaustible army. It really absolves um, individuals and also governments of, you know, their responsibility. And it absolves them of even trying to consider their responsibility in, you know, creating the conditions for all of these diseases to emerge, and then creating the conditions of poor governance and failing systems that allow epidemics to turn into pandemics, right? So, you know, these kind of mythic archetypes have real consequences. Um, and I think it is very important to consider how we talk about um, these phenomena um, and to think about you know, what kind of power it might have to talk about them differently and to you know, 
construct new sorts of stories um, around these phenomena because you know when you really what's really happening you know with diseases like COVID-19, Ebola, Zika, and so on, is that we are going to them, you know. We as humans are <laughs> industrializing these, these territories that have been wild, right, for ever. Um, we're deforesting, <laughs> you know, huge swaths of the planet. We're driving animals that never used to be into, in contact with humans to completely change their habitats. That's how they come into contact with domesticated animals. That's how these viruses then come into contact with us. All of this is happening because of things that humans do, you know, and we're the drivers of all of this. So unless we really start to reconsider like human behavior, <laughs> <laughs> then we're not going to change the underlying reasons um, for why new diseases emerge and um, all of the kind of diseases that are resurgent that were thought to be, you know, eradicated or under control, like um, malaria, which is resurging in an incredibly scary way, cholera, which is resurgent in a very scary way, and so on, are resurgent because of climate change, right? Um, so again, human behavior is driving all of this. And there are things that, you know, individuals can do, but also there are things that governments should be doing and that we should be pushing them to do. So I think, you know, don't fall into this, you know, very easy way of talking about, um, you know, the, the dynamic between man and microbes, right? Because it's much too simple to describe what's really happening. Yeah, and I think um, one has to congratulate the Science Gallery in Bangalore for organizing the series of talks because, mm -hmm. you know, I think what they're trying to do is really open out yeah. Uh, what tends to be often a very kind of uh, specialized and sometimes difficult to understand for people who are not really in the medical field and you know there's and then so many narratives get spun around it uh, yeah. and of course the worst of these is the the narrative of the war on the virus mm -hmm. you know it kind of just shows the yeah. failure of us uh, as human beings uh, to not be able to actually transcend the it's kind of intrinsic hostility that we have towards yeah. everything, right? Everything. And, uh, unless we change the narrative, as you're strongly recommending through your film of um, being at war with everything other, and including ourselves, of course, uh, we're not really going to go anywhere. So, on that very uh, depressing note, I think I'll hand it over to guys. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Rashmi and Mariam, for a very enlivening and um, timely conversation about Mariam's uh, film. So uh, I'd like to use the privileges of an MC to ask you a couple of questions before we move on to the audience. The audience, mm -hmm. uh, please do share your questions with us. Uh, we have the filmmaker with here to answer your questions. So please do uh, put your questions in the Q&A box and we'll pass them on to both Mariam and Rashmi. Uh, so Mariam, I was just wondering, and this is something that uh, Rashmi also uh, touched upon in her closing comments. Uh, your film, obviously, it uses a lot of archival footage and, uh, you know, you can see the amount of research that has gone into producing even the eight minute shot. So how do you think artists and filmmakers like yourself can push the boundaries of um, investigative research because it appears to me that even the film also in those eight minutes goes through you know the philosophy and history of medicine and how ideas around treating diseases and um, it, taking care of the sick have evolved in that time so um, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on that yeah I think um, I was very fortunate in making this particular film to have uh, the support of a really fantastic research team. Um, and uh, we, we actually did the research in a really interesting way, which could be something that other artists and filmmakers 
could take up. So um, I actually convened a team of five researchers and two research coordinators. We did the research in a really intensive kind of six week burst um, and uh, did it as sort of like a semi seminar um, using Zotero, the open source digital humanities software as our shared library and kind of shared brain um, for the for this period of research. And um, we would meet, everyone would be researching independently, but we met once a week to kind of have this like hour long seminar slash think tank kind of <laughs> convening um, and to sort of, you know, come together, share what each of us had learned and then, you know, set tasks to go back out. Um, that was interesting. I never tried to research a film that way before, and it actually worked extremely well. We managed to gather a lot of material in a very short amount of time. Um, and because I um, brought in people who had different kinds of expertise and different sorts of relationships to the material that I was looking for, they, they all brought really different perspectives to it and found really different things. Um, so you know, it was a luxury to be able to do that for sure. Um, but uh, it was really, really effective. Um, I think the, the one piece of advice I could give everyone is try to find um, someone who has real deep expertise in your, in your topic and collaborate with them. Um, so I worked with people who had uh, degrees in the philosophy and history of medicine. Um, and um, also um, with uh, a Victorianist <laughs> and with um, someone who had written an entire like master's thesis on autoimmunity and autofiction. Right? Um, those were among the researchers that I was working with. Also somebody who's now an epidemiologist who was you know, sort of in the process of you know, the degree. So yeah, so there were people who brought all these kind of different um, facets of expertise to it and had you know different angles on it that were that were really helpful yeah. that sounds very exciting mariam and <laughs> could you tell us a little bit about how this process has involved evolved while making the feature um especially given that most of uh, 2020 was spent in lockdown and you might not have had the same access to you know the institutions where you would have found sources so how 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 did you go about that process? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so the we were continuing to expand the um, archival research throughout the pandemic, and we had to, of course, do it completely online, which is, is never as deep um, or as broad in terms of archival research because there's always a lot of things that archives have that they haven't put online yet. Um, and no one was was even in the archives, of course, for for most of the past. Um, year and a half people were weren't even working in the archives so there was no way to access that that other material um, but the other thing we were doing was of course accumulating a kind of parallel archive of the present um, and collecting it with an eye to parallels specifically to material we'd already collected so um, kind of looking at what we were living through uh, in the light of what had happened in past epidemics and pandemics um, and trying to really, you know, flag those sort of visual parallels whenever we saw them um, and textual parallels as well. Uh, and so the, the archive did grow quite a lot, but in a really, really messy way, I would say. <laughs> so actually one of the things that's going on this month is my assistant editor is um, reorganizing all of the archival material before we start the new cut of the film because it, it just got really disorganized over over the year um, of the pandemic when the collecting was very diffuse I would say yeah also Mariam I was just wondering that um, in the film you show how in the 1700s there was this imagination of um, you know, a sick person being sick because they were sinners. And then over the past hundred years, it has evolved into this metaphors around disease and attacking an invisible mm -hmm. agent. 
um but now i mean especially the kind of language around the covid-19 pandemic we hear of um you know we're all in this together despite however true that statement might may or may mm-hmm. not be um do you think that in the future we could uh, also reimagine the language around pandemics and around diseases to be that of care and solidarity i might sound naive or idealistic when i'm saying this but i'd like i'd like to know what your mm-hmm. thoughts are and rush me as well mm-hmm. i mean i do think there's a way in which you know in in pointing out our our vulnerability you know there is there is a kind of solidarity in our common vulnerability right that that we all experience during during pandemics and i think with covid-19 in particular a lot of people have pointed this out because you know it's a respiratory disease and we are literally all you know sharing this air and responsible for for breathing together and that that there's a really strong experience of this common vulnerability you know during covid-19 and of this responsibility for each other that we all had to take on you know by masking um and by social distancing and by you know respecting all the safety protocols of of covid-19 it was you know this it wasn't it was a collectivity that was created through these um through these protocols uh so i think there's there is a way in which pandemics produce a kind of community um through common experience but the the question is is it is it a durable community <laughs> and that i think we don't know right um uh, and i also don't know that it's you know is it one community <laughs> also i i think it's more like it's probably more like multiple communities that share more similar experiences of the pandemic but i do think there is something in the in the precarity and the vulnerability you know that we that we all have to each other right um in these moments that that is meaningful and, and and is collective right um and i hope we i hope we can take that forward in some way so that's all the time we have for this evening uh, rashmi and madhya madhya any final thoughts that you'd like to leave the audience with before we close the session no i just uh... want to say thank you and i do hope that we are able to gathery uh you know picking up on your last question mm. that we are actually able to devise uh a new notion of care i think there will have to be a very radical destabilizing dismantling of current ideas around care which are to do with blood relations family friends and how do you, you know visualize a world of care that includes these but also transcends these. Uh, in some sense, so yeah, that's what I will end with. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Mariam, for joining us so early on a Sunday morning, and thank you so much, Rashmi, for uh, leading this very insightful uh, conversation. We're really glad that you both could make it here today. Uh, for those of you in the audience who miss watching the film, uh, we have shared a link in our chat box. So please do watch the film. It's a wonderful film, and Mariam will look forward to seeing the feature version soon. uh do share your feedback with us so we know what worked well for you and what we could do better going forward um at 6:30 pm today we have a lecture by literary and cultural historian ananya kabir who's going to speak about uh the language around dance in fact and how it was once referred to as electricity but now has evolved into a contagious behavior and it's going to be a fascinating lecture and we hope to see you all there um do visit the exhibition and do sign up for our programs we we will be programming every weekend up until june 13th so we hope to see you all at our future programs and thank you all for coming we hope you're staying safe and staying at home do take care and have a good weekend bye bye thank you bye bye